I just wanted to say how pleased we are to have Gwen Ottinger with us today. She is a professor in IAS, and she'll be talking with us and leading a discussion as well. And so we'll look forward to write down all your questions so that you can ask lots of good questions at the end. We really appreciate you all being here today. Um, Professor Ottinger is, um, her PhD is uh, in energy and resources from the University of California, Berkeley. And she explores really interesting questions about science and scientific expertise and how that's constructed and used in decision making um, in environmental issues. And she'll be talking with us today around some of those issues. And we really appreciate your sharing this with us. Well, thank you for having me. Gosh, I don't like it. Um, and, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, it's good to have you. Uh, so, let's see, I wonder if this works. Bear with me a second. Yes, it works. All right, so I'm here to talk about my research, which I describe as an ethnography of community industry relations in a fence line community. And so the first thing I want to do is to orient you to my research by unpacking that, saying what all that means. So let's start here with the fence line community. I use this term in a very natural way because it seems very intuitive to me, but I realize it's not to everybody. What I mean is, um, I, I'm talking when I say fence line, I'm talking about the fence that goes around a hazardous facility, in this case, an oil refinery. And in many cases, like the one you see in the picture, <coughs> there are um, houses sitting right next door to that fence line. Um, in this case, you're looking across the street and across a vacant lot from somebody's porch onto the property of a major oil refinery in southeastern Louisiana. Um, the refinery at the time that I did my study was owned by a company called Orion. Um, it's now owned by the multinational Valero Oil Company, which is the largest refiner in the US. Um, and what you're seeing is a piece of a storage tank that holds millions of gallons of gasoline um, it's about a football field in diameter, um, and I, I don't know how many stories high. Stories high. Five, six, ten, I'm not sure. Um, and the, the community is called New Sarpy, Louisiana. Now, here's a, a satellite map. The blue bit here is the Mississippi River. Um, if you kept going down this way, you'd hit New Orleans. I don't know, it's somewhere over here. Um, New Orleans is about 20 miles away, 25 miles away maybe. Um, if you keep going up this way, you hit Baton Rouge. Um, and that's, uh, gosh, maybe 70 miles. Um, and that whole area is dominated along the river by a series of petrochemical plants, okay? Plants that take in barrels of crude oil and make um, gasoline, kerosene, jet fuel, um, ethylene, propylene, the feedstocks of plastics and synthetic fibers, ethylene glycol. Um, and in addition, a series of sort of more refined chemicals, right? So all of those things I'm talking about are feedstocks um, that go into other kinds of products, right? It gets up, up and up the food chain. All right, so New Sarpe, the community that I studied is right here. Okay, and that storage tank that we're looking at is there, more or less. This is one refinery, the Valero refinery. A lot of the rest of this is another refinery, um, a shell, formerly a shell oil refinery, which now belongs to Motiva, which is a joint venture of Shell and Saudi Aramco. Um, and there's a shell chemical plant sort of mingled in here to by historical accident, and the rest of it is over here. This greener area is another community called Norco. And you can see how it's sandwiched in between those two massive plants. Um, while Norco was not a focus of my study, it became a place where I also, um, I also looked at it. There were a lot of connections, there were a lot of similarities, so it became an important place to triangulate. Okay. Um, so that's our fence line community, two fence line communities in that picture. Um, all right. So let's talk then about community and industry relations. Um, on the one hand, this is a euphemism, okay? What I went to study was an environmental justice campaign. 
the people who lived in that community were saying, wait, this place is way too close to us. The emissions from the refinery are making us sick. It's not fair that we, a low-income community, should be this close and this endangered by a refinery that blows up every week. Um, and they were calling for relocation. They wanted Orion to buy their homes at a fair market value so that they could move someplace else. Um, now what I was particularly interested in was the use of science in this campaign. So people in that community used this, actually people in both of those communities, Norco had a similar campaign, used this device, um, which you wouldn't know it, but it's, a, it's an ambient air sampler. Um, so it sucks in air into a plastic bag inside, and that air can be sent to a laboratory and you can find out what's in it, how much benzene's in it, how much vinyl chloride is in it, that kind of thing. So they were using that to insert data into the campaign. They were sort of trying to beat the experts at their own game. And I thought this was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's what I wanted to study, an environmental justice campaign, the use of science in an environmental justice campaign. Um, but, and I started calling it community industry relations because it had much broader resonance with the people that I was um, talking to. But halfway through the period of my research, so I, I designated a whole year to be down there, from July 1st of one year to June 30th of the next, um, that I would be there. On December 18th, this community uh, decided that they would settle their claim against the refinery. They dropped the lawsuit that they had, um, they accepted a series of home improvement loans, and they decided that everything was okay or okay enough. Um, and within a few years, uh, this was what we had. Um, a, a proclaimed affiliation between the neighborhood and the refinery. So, no, I didn't know that this sign would appear at the time, but at the time I sort of had a choice. Well, um, I could continue to go follow the environmental justice story, right? I could, I could go look at the next campaign and go look at the next um, place where those uh, ambient air samplers were being used and try to build conclusions based on that. But I didn't. I said, you know, okay, there are 180 oil refineries, or thereabouts, in this country. And at any given moment, how many are you hearing about having campaigns? It's like, I don't know, two, three, right? How many have ever had campaigns against them? Well, I don't know. A, a dozens, certainly. Maybe not all. But it seems to me that there are many, many more people living with refineries than protesting against them. So I decided that that's what I would be interested in. <coughs> which brings us to the last bit of this construction, which is sort of the, the, the most, the one that requires the most delving into. My project is an ethnography, okay? Um, so what does ethnography mean? Ethnography is the method um, closely associated, intertwined really, with anthropology, okay? It's a kind of qualitative social science research. Now what it implies, what it means for me, um, is immersion in the place and thick description of it. Okay, so what did I actually do? And I'm gonna have to refer to my list um, because I did a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> First, I volunteered at a nonprofit organization that was helping the community in their campaign. And I took a funny role as a quasi-expert because I had um, some basic engineering training. I didn't have basic engineering training. I had a bachelor's degree in engineering, which, um, while not chemical engineering, gave me some facility with numbers, which was not part of what the um, organization had access to otherwise. Um, I attended campaign events, like the ones that you just saw pictures of. Um, I lived not exactly in the community, because the, the, there wasn't really rental housing there, or not rental housing that would be obvious to an outsider, but I lived very close to the community as opposed to 25 miles away in New Orleans. Um, I sort of hung out in the community as much as I could. I invited myself over to people's places. 
Um, I volunteered. I did. I sat on I sat on porches and I ate gumbo and I drank chicory and I ate watermelon with salt. You know they put salt on it down there. I don't know. Um, it was new to me. Uh, I and the community that I was studying was half um, white and half African American. So these kinds of things I did very easily in the white community, and a lot of the people um, who were involved in the campaign were were much older people. Um, so it was you know, very easy, a, a young person willing to listen to their stories, very easy kind of um, relationship to, to build. Uh, I also, it, in the African American part of the community, it didn't work that way. But what I did there, I went to church. Um, and I showed up every Sunday. And I helped with the Saturday um, take food to the um, sick and shut in. Uh, mission and I did the after school tutoring program and I got to know people that way. Um, and in the process I was asking people about their history in the community, about what this, what is this place like? And as they told me, I was noticing, well, what are the, what's the terminology that's meaningful to people? What are the ideas that I keep hearing over and over? What do people seem to take for granted? People, for example, would tell me over and over again that they had a tight-knit community. And that, I didn't know what that could possibly mean in a place where everybody sort of hung out on their own front porch and at best, you know, wove, waved to their neighbor as they drove by. Um, so I started asking, well, what, what do you mean by that? Okay, so that's a lot of what an ethnography is. What do you mean by that? Um, and then, because I was studying community industry relations after the campaign ended, I made an effort to get to know and to hear from the people who worked, not the rank and file people who worked in the plants, but the plant managers, okay? Um, so I took tours, I went to community meetings, I did interviews with managers at all three of those plants I just showed you. All right. Um, and I collected flyers and handouts and stuff whenever I could, and I took lots and lots of notes. Every day I went home, I wrote for hours about what I saw, what I noticed. Um, and now as I'm writing my book on this, I'm using those notes to write about that. Okay, so then there were two, so that's, that's what I did. And I know that those of you who are registered for the Lam course really wanted to know what did I do. Um, there are two other things that in my mind makes this an ethnography. First, and I already talked about this a little bit, is the focus on everyday life. Right, that uh, I stayed there and said, how do you live with a refinery, rather than running off to the next campaign, um, or say, following the thread of the science. Um, the first, uh, both of those would have been very legitimate strategies. And they would have yielded different projects, different results, different findings. Um, uh, a sociologist, for example, would have been very likely to go to the next campaign. I study, it would be a social movements project. Right? STS people like me tend to focus on the science itself. And this was a very conscious decision on my part to say, well, no, we need to know not only about the science when it's there, but also about when it's absent and why it's absent. Okay. Um, oh, right, okay, so there's my um, picture of everyday life. Uh, this was a this was the family who taught me to salt my watermelon. Um, finally, I think what characterizes my project as an ethnography is the relationship between my empirical research and the social theory that's involved. Um, in February, I think it was February, Wadia Udell was here and she was in the same slot doing a talk, and she did this beautiful job. Uh, with her qualitative research, quantitative research of sort of laying out why she did what she did. She said, okay, so here's the broad area, and from research that has already been done, we know this, and we know that, and we'd predict this, but the empirical research doesn't quite bear that out, and we might predict that, but the research is kind of, I don't know, uh, like it points in two different directions, and so there was some, were some questions to be asked right around here that the, you know, the theory and the research together suggested these questions 
And she went and asked those questions and um, you know, came back with answers to them. Do the statistics you know, support? How did the statistics answer my question? Okay, that, that is not how anthropologists do it, alas. Um, there's a much looser relationship um, to theory and to prior research. And I think about it this way. The theory that we have, the social theory, helps us make sense of what we observe in the field. And then through thick description of our observations of what's going on, um, that helps us speak back to the theory, helps us make it better, helps us make it more complete, more nuanced, stronger. In the end, I don't actually think this is any different from what Wadia was doing. Uh, but it's a difference of style and a difference of kind of um, formality about it. Okay, and I just I want to highlight that because I think that's actually what makes me different than a sociologist. Because most most people studying these kinds of issues are sociologists, um, but they would go in with much more of a question to be answered as opposed to this kind of approach that we're talking about. All right, so the rest in the rest of the talk, um, what I want to tell you is, well, so what were the observations? How did theory help me make sense of them? And how does my empirical work speak back to that theory? Okay? Um, all right, so one thing that I noticed, straight off the bat, was a whole bunch of people saying, we were here first, okay? So here are two representative quotes from the community. <clears throat> when I moved here, them tanks and all, that, that, that tank you were looking at, wasn't there. It wasn't there, and they infringed on my rights. And then another person, the plant came and found us here. See, we were here first, and like I said, they moved in on us. You heard this all the time from people mad about that refinery. All right, you're nodding your heads. This this sounds like what you'd expect. But now look at this. Oops. This is a um, from a brochure uh, newsletter from the Shell chemical plant and the Motiva refinery that I showed you on that map. Um, and this is sort of the logo for their Good Neighbor Initiative, as far as I could tell. It was on all of their newsletters, their monthly newsletters. And it says, strengthening our roots in North Carolina. All right? Now, the, the, the message of this image is, OK, we're here for the long term. But the subtext is, we've always been here. We have deep roots here. We grew up here with the community. Even the community would not be here if we weren't here, all right? And, and, and Norco has a long history and politics that I'm not going to go into right now. But I want you to notice how this is the same kind of claim to privacy. Both sides of the fence line. People are saying, we were here first. No, we were here first. Even more than that, I haven't headed you off. In the question and answer period, one of you, or maybe three of you, but put your hands up and said, well, so who was there first? Because every other talk I've given about this research has involved that question. And it, it, that was the case even before I immersed myself in the community and the whole time I was there. And you know, I, the whole time, I had to say, well, wait a minute. These people are saying the refinery makes us sick and it's not fair that I should have to live next to this ugly, dangerous, belching thing, when you people, who are richer and whiter, and still drive cars, don't, right? So every time I heard this question, I thought, well, wait a minute. Well, what's that about? Who was there first? Doesn't seem particularly relevant if what we're talking about is actually justice, you know? Fairness and health. All right. So what's going on here? Okay, this is where my theory comes in. Um, so in social science theory, 
people are describing our um, a, a contemporary form of governance, uh, of ways that states interact with everything. You know how the how the government interacts with us um, and the entities that it regulates as neoliberalism. Okay, and the idea of neoliberalism is. I mean, it's, it's very complicated, multifaceted, extensive, but basically it says that the government is increasingly putting more and more of the traditional roles of the liberal state off on other entities, okay? So it's looking to markets, you know, market-based solutions, market-based strategies. You can think about cap and trade, right? We're not gonna put, we're not gonna say you, you can't put out more than this much carbon dioxide into the air. Instead, we're just going to let the market take care of it. Okay, market-based schemes. Uh, privatization of social services is another aspect of this. All right, um, school, school choice, right? We should privatize the schools um, and then people can choose, right? So that's a combination of privatization and a market-based solution. Um, is there something I want to add? Oh, uh, increasing increasingly looking to state governments and local governments as the service providers instead of the federal government. So now if a, um, so now for example, state governments and local, state and local school boards are competing for grants from the federal government to improve their uh, education systems instead of the education systems just being funded outright. Uh, all of these are neoliberal forms. Okay. The bit about the theories that describe neoliberalism that helped me out were the parts that talk about how the ideal um, citizen is constituted under these schemes, right? Um, and the idea here is that the government, well, the theory goes that the ideal citizen governs him or herself, okay? And that's what the enterprising individual is. Somebody that the state doesn't have to do for, but that proactively does for him or herself. Okay, so some characteristics. Um, the, an enterprising individual takes charge of his or her own health and well-being, right? So if you're an enterprising individual, and you're going to move, you're going to buy a house somewhere. You're going to buy a house somewhere that maximizes your potential to thrive. You're going to buy a house someplace safe, someplace with good schools, someplace that you can afford. Okay. Enterprising individuals seek out expert advice. So they consult a financial counselor to make sure they really can afford it. They look at the statistics, the crime rates, check out the crime reports. Um, they uh, see, I, I don't know what measures people use to determine how good the school districts are, but I can't talk to a friend who is buying a house without them saying, and it's in a great school district. I don't know how you know these things, but people go find that out. Um, and, and that's all, you know, a, sort of a um, technocratic, bureaucratic thing that's, that's happening if there are experts with, with these numbers that, that can that can inform our choices. And that's the other thing. Once we have that information, you make an informed choice. Deliberate, rational, conscientious. And finally, bad things don't happen to enterprising individuals. I'm serious. Well, sort of. Um, that when if you are moving through the world in this proactive way. The line is not that um, you are where you are because uh, luck or misfortune or whatever landed you there. Um, it's because of your choices. So if your home is foreclosed on, you hear this in the news every day, if your home is foreclosed on, why is that? Because you made a poor decision. Not because the structure was stacked against you somehow, but because you made a poor decision. Okay? Um, 
if you lose your job, an enterprising individual may say, well, it's the economy. But then the next thing you do is say, okay, I'm networking. And I'm going to an employment consultant, and I'm doing these job retraining things, and if it's six months and I still haven't been a, get, able to get a job, I must not be networking hard enough. Or, what am I doing? I've sent out a million net resumes, right? Okay, so this is the logic of the enterprising individual. And it's an ideal, it's an idealization, but it's also an expectation that's built into the way our system operates. And it's a way that we have come to think about ourselves. All right, for every one of those things that I just said, that you sort of snickered at, you've done another one of them, I bet, right? You, you, you've made that kind of rationalization. Okay, <clears throat> so, I'm make sure I'm making all the points. All right, so how does this get back to the question of who was there first? Well, it's all about informed choice and how did people get to be in the place that they are. Because so I just outlined, well, what would you do to make a good choice about where you live? But let's look at how people actually ended up living in New Sarpy. So I talked to this uh, one resident about it. So she says, when we came back to visit my mother for her 80th birthday, someone was telling my husband that they were looking for an agency director, because that's what he's always done, insurance and they needed a director. So he went for the interview, and they went back, and they wanted him to start the next week. Then we had to find a place to stay, and my brother says, well, nobody's living in that house, a, a house that the family owned, but we'll fix it up for you. And so that's how we got back home. I guess it's, God works out everything. My mother was sick, and someone needed to be here. I'm the oldest now. I was the oldest girl, and my brother, who had died a few months earlier, was the oldest boy. So you know, it's just my responsibility, that's it. So now, this is a story told by somebody who lives three blocks from the refinery. She's a little unusual in her level of education. She has a, a master's um, in social worker educational policy or, or something like that. Um, most, most members, certainly of the white part of the community, and for the most part, the black part of the community, um, are not so highly educated, not so professional, and, and this family had sort of moved around a bunch, but it was not atypical for people to go away and come back. Um, and her reasons for coming back looked nothing like that uh, logic of informed choice that I just gave you. Um, so she had a whole bunch of reasons to be there. Um, some of them were circumstance, right? Kind of this was the time that she needed to come back and there was a house available. Um, she had family times there. She had grown up there. That was a story for many people. Um, other people uh, had more uh, economic need, and people didn't talk to me about that in very um, explicit ways. But for example, uh, one woman who I knew had moved back to New Sarpy again after growing up there, going away to college, having a professional job, and then she got divorced. And she wanted to bring her kids back to be raised around family. I can only assume that as a single mother that there was some advantage to being able to build her house on land that her grandmother owned. I don't know whether she bought it from the grandmother or um, you know, just put the house on it by sort of family consent. Um, either way, it's, it's, gotta be, it's gotta be a help, right, in your economic life. Um, so all these kinds of things went into the choice, right? So people don't freely make choices, but we, we kind of knew that, right? This is, this is not a huge surprise. You can kind of read your own choices um, in this way that says, yeah, that enterprising individual thing is, is an idealization at best. Okay, so that's one piece of it. But the enterprising individual logic also says that we make informed choices informed by expert advice. And I found out some interesting things about that as well. So in order to make an informed choice about do you live in this community next to a refinery, you'd have to know, well, what are the effects of the refinery? How serious are they? Um, how 
uh, how extensive, what are they, uh, will they affect my, my health, will they affect the health of my kids, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, logic presumes that there's a body of information that you can go and get and learn from. In fact, the knowledge of the refinery's effects from the point of view of people who've lived there and been associated with this community for a long time is always changing. Okay, so one resident who, uh, again, had grown up there, uh, had raised her kids there, said years ago, we were really ignorant of the fact that these chemicals cause all these cancers. So we were all ignorant of that fact. And I think most of them, the refineries, were ignorant too, because they didn't realize what they were doing. And actually, my interviews with refinery personnel back this up, right? One of the engineers I spoke to said, you know, what we did 30 years ago in terms of dumping waste, untreated waste, into the waterways, we never do today. But at the time, it was best practice, OK? So the knowledge is always changing. A lot of that knowledge is also only available through personal experience. Okay, so um, I talked to one of the newest residents of the community who had just bought his house a couple years earlier and then joined this campaign. And he told me that when buying his home, I considered a little bit the plant right there, but I didn't think there was any kind of hazard or anything. But then two years later, he says, now, right, sometimes I wake up and it's hard for me to breathe. Like today, it's a lot harder to breathe than normal. Now, this guy coming in as an outsider could not have known that. There's no warning sticker on the community, no expert to tell you, well, you can live there, but some days it might be hard to breathe. Um, and this is what we in STS call local knowledge. Okay, so, so both of these things are, um, just like the, the last slide were, you know, structures that sociologists could have told you all about. These are things that um, uh, science and technology studies can tell you all about. The final thing is that the, the knowledge of refineries effects is incomplete and it's contested, okay? So there aren't really systematic studies done on the relationship between uh, exposures to toxic chemicals at the level experienced by people living in those communities um, for, the, for the duration of time that they experience them um, and what the actual health effects are. They would be very hard studies to do. Until very recently, you wouldn't even have had the data to do them. Um, so they're just not there. There's no expert to go consult. There's no information on which to base your choices. OK. So. In theory, expert knowledge. So in this enterprising individual theory, we have expert knowledge. It's there. It's kind of a black box. It's certain. It's relevant. It's available. Okay? You can make informed choices because you have the information if only you desire to go get it. In practice, what my study finds, not only are choices constrained by a bunch of other things, even if you had all the room to make any choice you wanted, that knowledge is contested, is changing, and it's spotty. Okay, so what do we do now? Right? Do we say, okay, well, this enterprising individuals thing, it's a hoax. It's it, it's just not, it's not real, evidently. It's got, you know, it's not useful for us. Well, no, actually, this is not where we go. Uh, this is the part where we speak back to the theory. So because that theory does describe something important, right, the way that people are asked to be certain kinds of subjects under a neoliberal state, what's more useful and interesting to do is think about, through this research, how this deeply held idea of ourselves as enterprising individuals uh, functions under these circumstances on the right, not those circumstances on the left. Okay, what the theory tells us now is how it might function under what's on the left. But we can say something about how it functions on the right. Okay, so there are two things that I think are important. First, under those circumstances, what happens is that 
experts' status as themselves enterprising individuals, substitutes for that knowledge that's contested, changing, and spotty. Okay, so here's a, a plant manager from one of those plants talking about why, how he knows that the community's um, concerns about their health are baseless. I'm not a stupid man, okay? I've got three small kids and a wife. I'm certainly not gonna live or work anywhere where my health is at risk. I'm sorry, I'm a little too selfish for that, okay? And I wouldn't be in this plant if I felt I was being exposed to benzene or SO2, I wouldn't do it for my own self-preservation. But I know it's not an issue. I know this plant is clean. I know there's not an emission problem here. I know there's not an exposure problem here. Okay? Now this man is in a slightly better position to know a lot of those things than community members. He has the, the training to look at the numbers. He has a few more numbers than the community members do. But he doesn't have the kind of systemic studies that you really need to know what the emissions are doing to people over a long period of time at low doses in combination. The information is just not out there, right? He doesn't have some special line. So in the absence of it, he's, what he's saying is, because I am an enterprising individual, we know that the plant's okay. Except my presence here as evidence, right? So his status as an enterprising individual working in the plant is the evidence, right? That's, that's an interesting dynamic. Okay, the second point. Uh, and this one's a little more complicated, is that residents end up accepting experts' formulations of risk to maintain their status as enterprising individuals. Now, I don't have a quote that shows that in a direct way. Uh, the quote there um, actually shows how deeply held residents' notions of themselves as enterprising individuals is. Right? So this woman uh, says, I really believe that this plant, the refinery, is vital to the national energy. Do I think it's more important than my health? And she'd just gotten t done telling me how absolutely convinced she was that the plant had health effects. Completely convinced that if they did the studies right, they'd find it. Okay? Do I think it's more important than my health? No. But you know, at this point in time, I choose to build my house here and live here. So one day I'll choose to move. Okay? Despite all of her connections to the community, despite all of her economic and circumstantial reasons for being there, despite her belief that the plant has effects from her health, she's saying, I chose to be here and I will choose to move. This is her representing herself as not a victim, but a proactive um, participant in her own well-being. All right, so what happens then is that when experts talk about the risks associated with the uh, chemical plants, what they do is talk in terms that appeal to residents' personal responsibility. Okay, so there's, there's this, um, the area is called Cancer Alley, that, that uh, region between uh, New Orleans and Baton Rouge, depending on which side of, uh, of the issue you're on. It might be called um, the Mississippi River Industrial Corridor, or it might be called uh, Cancer Alley. And the Louisiana Chemical Association has, has this Cancer Alley thing really stuck in their craw. You can tell the activists did a good job. Um, <laughs> and so they commissioned a study uh, that actually did a, use the Louisiana Tumor Registry's data and did um, a comparison of cancer rates there. And what they found was that cancer incident rates are not higher in that region than in other comparable places. And, and who knows how they define comparable. No doubt we could deconstruct that and call it into question. Cancer death rates were higher. Um, and they say, okay, well, but cancer death rates are higher because people are poor, they smoke a lot, they drink a lot, they don't go to the doctor, they don't have health insurance. Those cancers go undetected and untreated until it's too late to save them, okay? So that's the line. So every, every year or so, 
um, there are community meetings where the head of the Louisiana Tumor Registry comes to the community and she presents this data. Right? There's a constant war on Cancer Alley as, a, uh, as an idea. Uh, and the message of that is these health concerns that you are, um, that you have, all of those things, you can do things about them. You need advanced screening for this. You know, the, I think the, the one place where the cancer incidence rate is higher is breast cancer in black women. Um, but so you all need to be getting mammograms regularly, early, often, you know, all that stuff. Okay, so it gets pulled into that language of personal responsibility. And except under very unusual conditions, people say, okay, you know, this is, I chose to live here and one day I'll choose to move. Right? Now, <clears throat> it's important to think about the stakes associated with not accepting that information. If you say, well, I don't believe your numbers, first of all, there's something of an obligation. Well, what are your numbers then? Um, but saying that, you know what, no, I'm trapped here. You are making me sick. You have trapped me here because I can't sell my home to everybody else. And you're making me sick. Suddenly, you are not an enterprising individual anymore. Okay? Now, what's the cost, personally, of saying, I, I, you know, I am not in control of my life. I didn't choose this. That's that's a cost. That's a real cost. And in the what the social science literature tells us about that is that not only is it a personal cost, but people who end up in that category are of not enterprising individuals are subject to state paternalistic state interventions, sort of authoritarian interventions in a way that uh, that other people aren't, okay? So those kinds of interventions you see <coughs> for prisoners and welfare mothers and, and things like that, all right? So for people who are um, working class, next to a refinery, sort of hanging on to that level of respectability by a thread in some cases, some cases more than, you know, um, that's a really big cost. Okay, so I just got one more slide, and then I'll let you <coughs> ask questions. So, um, the conclusions of these two findings, just stated in a slightly larger way, is first of all, expertise and this kind of enterprising individual, this enterprising personhood, uh, are, are co-constituted, right? That <coughs> um, enterprising persons. Uh, be, Enterprising persons, uh, so sh enterprising person, enterpr having the identity of an enterprising individual backs up one's claim to expertise. Just like uh, enterprising individuals are sort of founded on the idea that you can refer back to some kind of expertise for informed decision making. Okay. Um, and the second point that, that relates to what I was just talking about in terms of the, the cost. Um, the ability to claim your status as an enterprising individual varies with your socioeconomic status to start with. That if you are, uh, if you have a degree in chemical engineering and an MBA and you're sitting um, at, the, at the big desk in the plant manager's office at the refinery with the, um, the aerial photo of your domain blown up like one of those, uh, it's, it's for every office like this has has something that size with the with the, an aerial photo of the plant behind it. It's like the marker of the plant manager's um, desk. So if you were sitting in front of one of those signs in the plant manager's office, you get to say, I'm too smart to be working or living someplace that could hurt me. And that gets to be evidence. If you're sitting half a mile away, uh, in a, in, a, in a living room of a modest home on your grandmother's land, you have to do a whole lot more work. You have to be really careful 
to continue to represent yourself as an enterprising individual. Okay. Um, that's what I had to say. Uh, I would be, I'd love to take your questions. I see, I see wheels turning as I talk, so I'm uh, looking forward to this.